was supposed to be a day of mourning, a day of defeat. It was a day for the critics and skeptics to point the finger. Your savior was a fraud. His death has proven it. He is buried, he is gone, and he will be forgotten. It was supposed to be a day of darkness and a day of grief. A day when broken and confused followers felt lost and overwhelmed with hopelessness. Even those who went to visit the tomb that day expected to find nothing more than a lifeless body. It was supposed to be a day of sadness and weeping. But you transformed it into a day of rejoicing, a day of victory, a day when the children of God can shout with confidence, He is alive, He is risen and he will never be forgotten. This day has driven out all darkness and grief, erased all sin and shame. A day when followers of the true Savior are flooded with purpose, promises, and hope. This day echoes through the halls of history as the day our king crushed the head of the snake, tore through the chains of death itself, and claimed mankind for his kingdom. Tears of despair have become tears of overwhelming joy. For the Lord, Jesus Christ, has made this day of sorrow into a day of worship.
Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. John 11:25. to Easter Sunday. We are so delighted, and you may have a seat. We are so delighted to have each and every one of you here with us today. Welcome to any who are visiting with us and some old friends who are back with us. We are just delighted. This is the most glorious day to be a Christian, isn't it? <laughs> and uh, I was reminded of a story uh, Dr. George Sweeting tells in the early 20s of a communist leader during those days of Soviet Russia he was sent from Moscow to, interestingly, Kiev to address an anti-God rally. Uh, so for an hour, this man uh, ridiculed and abused the Christian faith until it seemed like he'd destroyed the whole foundation of, of uh, Christianity. Then he invited questions. 
Well, then an Orthodox church priest rose and asked to speak. He just turned and faced the people and gave the Easter greeting. He is risen. Instantly, the assembly rose to its feet, and the reply came back loud and clear. He is risen indeed. <laughs> so we are going to use that this morning as a cue. And since you've all, many of you have come here for breakfast, and I told Steve he makes my job really difficult now. Um, so we're going to give you a little exercise. And when we give the call, he has risen, you have to rise to your feet and say loudly, he has risen indeed. Okay, so we're going to practice. He is risen. He is risen. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> so remember that. You're going to hear it more than once. Uh, we might even wake you up during the sermon. <laughs> Uh, we do have uh, one announcement this morning uh, to give you. Our, our, uh, some of our men are getting together to help a new family among us, uh, the Ashfords, who are moving from over near Linden Town School to uh, right down the street from us. Uh, God has placed them, and so that's going to happen this Saturday. So um, we, we need helpers. Uh, we've, got the men, we've got the machines. We just need some able-bodied men who can lift. We have a number of us that can't do that. Uh, so if you're willing to help, um, could you please see Walt Goodell? Walt, where are you? Yeah, so Walt's right here. See Walt, and we're going to help uh, Scott and Melissa Ashford uh, get moving. Uh, Scott, where are you this morning? Scott and Melissa, yeah, okay. There, Scott's right down here uh, with, with his dad this morning, so um, we're going to help them move uh, this Saturday. So we just wanted to make you aware of that, and uh, oh, we ought to try it again. He is risen! He is risen! All right, good job. <laughs> we better sing about it. <laughs> I serve a risen Savior in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever will be made. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always there. He lives, he lives.
My name is James, and I'm one of the disciples, but not the one you're thinking of. I'm, I'm the other one. James the Lesser. That's what the disciples would call me to distinguish between the two of us. Through the years, that's why I started calling myself. That's how I thought of myself. I was the last disciple picked. I was never the top dog. But none of that matters anymore. Because Jesus was sealed in a tomb. And three days later, he flipped life as we know it on its head. Yeah. It was evening. We were all in this large room. And he appeared. And, and when I say that he appeared, it, it, I, mean, I mean, he was not there. And then all of a sudden, there, there he was. And he was telling us to, to calm down. He, he, he was telling us, telling us something about peace. I, I, I don't know. He was saying something about food. And, and I, I, I don't know if you work up an appetite conquering death. I, I... Needless to say, we were terrified, excited, and... Yeah, we were, we were really happy. <laughs> we thought it was over. We thought all of this was done. But instead, he put death in its place. <laughs> he did it. He did it. And when I look at myself, I see the disappointment. I see the dismissal. I see the lesser. And I realize I'm pretty forgettable. But then I remember, he did it. He conquered death. He did it for me because of the cross, because of Christ. I am redeemed, reborn even. He has set me free from my sin. He has set me free from myself. And I do not mind having less of me if it means I can have so much more of him. Easter. Uh, I'm Stephen Gadaby. For those of you who don't know me, I'm excited to, excited to lead the prayer today. Uh, I want to start by thanking everyone who came to the breakfast this morning, for all those who helped, all those who shared food in their time, the kitchen crew, Katie, Sherry, Thora, Tim, Sue jumped in, the deacons and all their hard work, and it just made the breakfast time go so smoothly, and, and I appreciate that. Um, you guys do a great job. So, and I realized that um, if I talk real slow today, they'll be finished cleaning in the back so I can then just, <laughs> you know, be done. Uh, so to, pr to prepare us for the prayer today, what, what? He is risen? <laughs> Oh, this is going to be fun, Pete. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, again, I'm sorry. To prepare us for the prayer today, I wanted to read both a poem and a Bible verse. This is Easter Joy by Joanne Fuchs. Jesus came to earth to show us how to live, how to put others first, 
how to love and how to give. Then he set about his work that God sent him to do. He put our punishment on himself. He made us clean and new. He could have saved himself, calling angels from above, but he chose to pay our price for sin. He paid it out of love. Our Lord died on Good Friday, but the cross did not destroy. His resurrection on Easter morn that fills our hearts with joy. <clears throat> now we know our earthly death, like his, is just a rest. We'll be forever with him in heaven where life is best. So we live our lives for Jesus. Think of him in all we do. Thank our Savior. Thank our Lord. Help us love like you. And then I wanted to read uh, Matthew 28, verse 5 and 6. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. And then Mark 16, 5 and 6. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side. And they were alarmed. Do not be alarmed, he said. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. He See the place where they lay him. Let us pray. God, we both praise and thank you today. You sent your son to live with us, to teach us, to die for us. In your love, you raised him from the dead. You did this because you loved us that much. He is both king, savior, and lord. We worship you for this. We pray you will bless our hearts, that you will open up our hearts to see your love and the love of Jesus. We pray we will accept this and walk down the narrow road to you and to your glory. We pray for those who have not accepted this truth, that you will work in their hearts and lives to accept and be a true follower of you. We thank you for the fellowship today. We pray that you can go that we can go forward in this week renewed and rejoicing in the celebration of your resurrection. Lord, we wanted to do a special prayer for Shane Ward. Shane was in a lot of pain this morning and is now in the ER. We pray for the healing of Shane. Lord, we also pray that you work through Joel as he shares your message to us on your beautiful Easter Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Steve, and uh, thanks again to all of our, uh, our kitchen crew. Um, I knew when I told them about this call and response, we might even, you know, some people you just can't trust with that much power. <laughs> he'd, ha he'd have you uh, up and down all morning, <laughs> and that would be okay. Um, but we want to uh, let all those involved in children's church the opportunity to be dismissed. Uh, God has blessed us with uh, many children here, and that's uh, something we're very, very grateful for. Um, well, today we celebrate the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is really the keystone uh, teaching or belief of our Christian faith. And the Apostle Paul said, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain and your faith is vain or worthless. That's a pretty strong statement coming from one who began as a skeptic of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, throughout history, many of uh, those who became the greatest defenders of the Christian faith and particularly of the resurrection started out as skeptics. Um, James Montgomery Boyce, in his uh, book on Acts, tells the story of two of them named Lord Littleton and Gilbert West. In the 18th century, there were two young men in England whose names were Lord Littleton and Gilbert West. They were unbelievers. In fact, they were strong in their unbelief. They were also both lawyers with keen minds, and they thought they had good reasons for rejecting Christianity. One day in a conversation, one of them said, Christianity stands upon a very unstable foundation. 
There are only two things that actually support it. The alleged resurrection of Jesus Christ and the alleged conversion of Saul of Tarsus. If we can disprove these stories, which would be rather easy to do, Christianity will collapse like a house of cards. Gilbert West said, all right then, I'll write a book on the alleged resurrection of Jesus Christ and disprove it. Lord Littleton said, if you write a book on the resurrection, I'll write on the alleged appearance of Jesus to the Apostle Paul. You show why Jesus could not possibly have been raised from the dead, and I'll show that the Apostle Paul could not have been converted, as the Bible says he was, by a voice from heaven on the road to Damascus. So they went off to write their books. Sometimes later, they met again, and one of them said to the other, I'm afraid I have a confession to make. I've been looking into the evidence for this story, and I've begun to think that maybe there is something to it after all. The other said, the same thing happened to me. But let's keep on investigating these stories and see where we come out. In the end, after they had done their investigation and had written their books, each had come out on exactly the opposite side he had, he had been when he began his investigation. Gilbert West had written The Resurrection of Jesus Christ, arguing that it is a fact of history, and Lord Littleton had written The Conversion of, of St. Paul, by treating the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the conversion of the Apostle Paul as two great pillars of Christianity, these men were saying that if the Apostle Paul was not converted, as the ninth chapter of Acts says he was, and he himself declares in his own recorded testimonies both before the Jews and the Gentiles, then Christianity loses one of its most important bulwarks. Moreover, it loses its most able theologian and is considerably weakened." You know, these guys that were changed from skeptics to great defenders of the faith, when they really looked honestly at the evidence, um, kind of begs the question for us, why is the resurrection so important to our faith? The reason the resurrection is so important to our faith is because the resurrection of Jesus is the proof of the value and the meaning of his death on the cross. It proves he is who he claimed to be, the very Son of God who overcame Satan and sin and death. And it proves God accepted his sacrifice for our sin and the sin of the world. And so this morning, I'd like to look at three witnesses to the resurrection. Uh, but these witnesses were, like Littleton and West, unwilling witnesses to the resurrection. Often, you know, the greatest proof uh, of the truth of an event is not from its followers, but from its doubters and its detractors. And all three of these witnesses began as skeptics, unwilling to believe in it, but at least two of the three became some of its greatest defenders. And the third group had to be paid, uh, paid off to lie about it. So we'll start with them. You know, it's impossible, I think, to really appreciate the events of the resurrection morning without remembering what has occurred this whole week. From the triumphant ride into Jerusalem to the shouts of the people who have, uh, we have passed for, to the plotting of his death, the tender and poignant events of the upper rune, the agony of Gethsemane, and all the horrible events of that Friday. Four trials, scourging, abuse, betrayal, arrest, denial by his friends, and finally the six-hour crucifixion and death, accompanied by an earthquake and other miracles. Late that Friday, Jesus was buried by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus while the women watched, and the next day the tomb was made secure at the Pharisees' insistence with a seal and a Roman guard. And so that takes us to Easter Sunday morning. The Roman guard, anywhere from four to 16 soldiers, must have thought this was the stupidest set of orders we've ever heard, guarding the tomb of a dead guy that some, from some religious nuts. How did we get picked to be up all night, outside, uh, bored to death for dead guy duty? Well, things were about to get a little bit more exciting, and we'll look at that in Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 15. We start with those shaking soldiers who were paralyzed by fear. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. 
Imagine these poor guards, tired, bored all night, quiet, waiting, and then just before dawn, a violent earthquake shakes them to their senses. And then some kind of Superman being with blindingly bright as lightning and, and a dazzling snow-white robe appears from nowhere, grabs the stone covering the tomb, rips it out of the groove, throws it aside, and sits down on top of it. Kind of God's way of saying, Happy Resurrection Day, boys! <laughs> The guards are shaking with terror and paralyzed by fear. It says they become like dead men. I don't know if that means they passed out before they ran away. I'm not sure. Um, But then the shocking reality of why the tomb is open is disclosed to his followers. But the angel said to the women in verse 5, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings! And they come up and came up and take, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. You know, in the meantime, as these soldiers are either passed out or running away, the women arrive, and after reassuring them not to be afraid, the angel tells them he knows why they came to seek the body of Jesus, a corpse, and then announces the message of Easter. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Let's try that. He is risen. risen All right, you can sit down. (laughs) This is the simple truth that is the basis of our whole Christian faith. The angel then invites them to see where Jesus had lay, having opened the tomb for that reason. I mean, not to let Jesus out, but to let them see in. He then tells them to go quickly and tell the disciples. And as they do, lo and behold, they briefly meet Jesus on the way. I love that. (laughs) But now back to the soldiers, the payoff to lie in verse, uh, beginning in verse 11. First, there's the report. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. You know, they report, oh, what, boy, trouble. (laughs) And so a bribe is offered. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers. (laughs) And that leads to the cover up in verse 13. And said, tell, 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 and he and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And of course, that requires political pr- protection. And so in verse 14, it says, and if this comes to the governor's ear, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. <laughs> and finally, there's the official report, and the deal is done. So they took the money and did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Doesn't all of that sound familiar to the politics of our day? (laughs) Some things never change. (laughs) A report, a bribe, a cover-up, a political protection, and an official report, that's basically a lie. (laughs) But you know, there is a prevailing truth in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And the problem with cover-ups and lies is that they are hard to maintain, especially when the facts keep getting in the way. In the case of Jesus' resurrection, he very inconveniently started showing up to more and more people, including 500 at a time at one time. (laughs) And besides that, the soldier's story was full of holes. I mean, I can just imagine Columbo or some detective reporter asking them, so let's see, all um, four or eight or however many of you there were, all of you fell asleep at the same time. And his followers snuck between all of you and rolled that huge stone right out of the groove and stole the body and no one woke up? And since you were all sleeping, how do you know that that happened? (laughs) And you're not worried about being punished for dereliction of duty? It's pretty severe, I hear. I wonder why. (laughs) All the opponents of Jesus ever had to do was produce the body. (laughs) They never could. But Jesus' followers believed it 
and were so convinced that most died to spread the word. And after more than 2,000 years, the truth of the resurrection is still prevailing, not only in spite of, but because of those shaking soldiers at the tomb. Why do so many fear the truth of the risen Lord? Why do some ignore it, reject it, despite the evidence, and believe the lie that it's unhistorical? I think the reason we fear it so much is because if it's true and proves that he is the Son of God who died on the cross for my sin and rose again and will come back one day as he said, then I'm accountable to him. I will face his judgment and die in my sin if I don't accept and receive the forgiveness that he offers through his death and resurrection. You see, there's a great peril in ignoring the truth. So why not accept the evidence and believe it instead? It wasn't only Jesus' enemies that had trouble accepting the resurrection. Even his own disciples had trouble believing it, as we saw in the video Uh, One of those disciples was especially doubtful. I call him the doubting disciple. And uh, his, his story is found for us in John chapter 20. You know, his name, of course, is uh, Thomas, Thomas the doubter. (laughs) We read about him in, uh, you know, having gone through all of the events uh, of that Easter Sunday morning, we begin to read his story in verse 24. It says, Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. You know, doubting Thomas earned his name for a good reason. He was absent when the other ten disciples, when Jesus appeared to them on Resurrection Sunday. Whether he was hiding or discouraged or alone in his grief or just somewhere else, we don't know. But you know, by Sunday night, the evidence was mounting that Jesus had risen. First of all, there was all that Old Testament prophecy and the the three explicit predictions of Jesus um, before he went to the cross that now somehow began to make sense. (laughs) Um, And then the stone rolled away, and then the empty tomb, and then the report of the women seeing angels and and, and eyewitnesses to seeing Jesus himself. And then we know from John's gospel that Peter and John ran to the tomb and and saw the graves closed, but all in order, and even the head cloth folded up by itself. Jesus' appearance later that day to Peter. And then, finally, his appearance to two men on the road to Emmaus, and finally his appearance to all ten of the other disciples. All of that had happened prior to what we're going to read about, um, about Thomas. Because he was absent, but the disciples tried to report the truth to him in verse 25. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. You know, they tried to convince Thomas they had truly seen Jesus. These were his friends. These are his fellow disciples that he had walked with for for three years with Jesus. But Thomas was obstinate in his unbelief, and he refuses to believe all these reports. For Thomas, seeing is believing. He quite forcefully and foolishly says that unless he sees and puts his hand into those nail marks and and into the spear mark in his side, he will never believe. Talk about a skeptic. (laughs) Oh, he must have come to regret those words. (laughs) Because verse 26 tells us that eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them this time. Although the doors were locked, shut and locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. You know, sometimes they included the days on either end, so this is probably a week later, the following Sunday, um, that Jesus shows up himself, <laughs> proving himself to be, um, to be God in his resurrected body. He, he just uh, either walks through the door or just appears in the room with a greeting of peace. <laughs> 
I wonder what Thomas thought when he said, peace be with you. It's like, "Uh uh-oh, Thomas. (laughs) And then Jesus gives him a challenge. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. First of all, Jesus already knows what Thomas had said. And then he confronts him to follow through with the challenge. One of those questions I always ask myself is, did he? <laughs> you know, did he actually have to put his hands? I don't know. Jesus then challenges him to stop being an unbelieving skeptic and instead believe. Literally, it's become, stop becoming an unbeliever and become a believer. Even as a follower of Jesus, even as a believer in Jesus, it was hard to convince Thomas to to, uh, believe in the resurrection. Well, Thomas responds appropriately with a great confession of faith. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. He responds to Jesus' challenge with the reality of the resurrection in this great confession of faith. For a monotheistic Jew to confess Jesus is God with two titles of deity affirms his belief in who Jesus is and that he has risen. And his confession, interestingly, becomes the climax of John's gospel. Well, Jesus in turn responds to bless those who have believed without seeing. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed, like many of us. Jesus comments that, um, you know, he pronounces a blessing on those who do not physically see the Lord, but see him by faith. And that need for faith is emphasized in the last couple of verses in John's comments. He says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John comments that the signs and the miracles that verify who Jesus were and and the careful record of those events by eyewitnesses such as himself were for a singular purpose, that the reader may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and the Son of God, and in so doing have life, eternal life, real life, his life, Uh, as a result. You know, there's a problem with faith. Why was Thomas so skeptical? Why was it so hard for him to believe in the resurrection? I think it's just simply because faith is required. In order to believe in Jesus, we must believe that God's word is true, including what it tells us about Jesus and his death and his resurrection. God must give us that faith to believe it, But we must choose to exercise that faith by committing ourselves to him and receiving him as our personal Lord and Savior. Hear the words of Jesus, do not disbelieve, but believe. And then we can say with Thomas, my Lord and my God. Well, our final witness to the resurrection was perhaps the ultimate skeptic. He's the one I call the persuaded persecutor, and his story is told for us in Acts chapter 26. Um, Paul the Apostle, formerly Saul of Tarsus, said of himself that last of all, as one untimely born, he, Jesus, appeared also to me. The testimony of his encounter with Jesus is told three times in the book of Acts, in chapter 9, um, and then in chapter 22, when he tells it to the Jews, and then in chapter 26, where he uh, stands before Agrippa, the king. In this last account, he is giving a, a defense before King Agrippa, before being sent to Rome due to his appeal to Caesar. And so we find him in the first couple of verses um, int- introduced to this. So Agrippa said to Paul, you have permission to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and made his defense. I consider myself fortunate that it is before you, King Agrippa, that I am going to make my defense today against all the accusations of the Jews, especially because you are familiar with all the customs and controversies of the Jews. 
Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Paul begins his defense. He begins his testimony, as it were, by talking about his Jewish religion, his his background in verses 4 through 8. He says, My manner of life from my youth, spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem, is known by all the Jews. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion, I have lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand here on trial because of my hope in the promise made by God to our fathers, to which our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship night and day. And for this hope, I am accused by Jews, O king. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? I can almost see him turning to the Jewish uh, detractors there and saying that. Why does it seem so incredible to you that I would say that Jesus has risen uh, from the, that God raises the dead? <laughs> you know, after addressing King Agrippa, Paul gives his background in the Jewish religion as a strict Jewish Pharisee. He appeals to the fact he is only holding to that which the Jewish faith and Hebrew scriptures teach according to the hope of the resurrection from the dead all throughout the Old Testament, including the suffering and death and resurrection of the Messiah that they were all anticipating and praying for. And so he says, it's right there in your scriptures. (laughs) Um, uh, I know. I, I studied under them. But the fact that he had once been one of them uh, tells us more. About, he tells us more about that. It wasn't just religion. Jesus was reviled by Paul, the persecutor. We see this in verses nine through eleven. I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth, and I did so in Jerusalem. I not only locked up many of the saints in prison after receiving authority from the chief priests. But when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in all the synagogues and tried to make them blaspheme. And in raging fury against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Saul, later Paul, though raised as a devout Jew, had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. He raged against Christians, persecuting them mercilessly, thinking he was serving God by attempting to stamp out this false religion. This religion was based on a belief in a false Messiah uh, named Jesus who had been crucified, but they claimed had risen from the dead. Of course, he didn't believe it for a minute. And it was on a mission to Damascus to arrest Christians that everything changed because Jesus, who he had reviled, would now be revealed to him. And we see in verses 12 through 18 his encounter with the risen Jesus. In this connection, I journeyed to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. At midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven brighter than the sun that shone around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads, you know, the the cattle prod. (laughs) And I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, and this must have been an explosion onto the mind and heart of the Apostle Paul. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand upon your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to anoint you as a servant and witness to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you delivering you from your people and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul explained that this Jesus he thought was dead stopped him in his tracks on the road to Damascus. A light brighter than the sun blinded him and forced he and his companions to the ground. And it was then he heard a voice saying in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And when he asked, who are you, Lord? The reply was, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Jesus then goes on to uh, commission Paul to be his servant and witness to the Jews as well as the Gentiles. Paul never got over that encounter with the risen Lord. 
He never recovered from it. It dictated every ounce of everything in him from that day forward. Um, he, he believed what he saw because he had become a witness to the risen Lord, even if it was a late one in his own words. Well, he received the Lord Jesus that day, and he responded in obedience to him. Verse 19 says, Therefore, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus, then in Jerusalem, and throughout all the region of Judea, and also to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. To this day I have had uh, the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, namely that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. Paul says, hey, I was obedient to that vision. He had met, he had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, the risen Lord, and he was ordained, he was commissioned to be his servant to be, and to be his apostle. And he, and he was obedient to that, to give the gospel, the good news, that Jesus had come, he had suffered, and he had died for our sins, but he had risen again to give that gospel to both Jews and Gentiles um, and that he would proclaim and be a light both to our people, the Jews, and to the Gentiles. You know, Paul had been a zealous, religious Jew, but he had been wrong about Jesus and his followers. Um, the key point of, of all true religion he had been absolutely wrong. He had religion, but he never had that personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Oh. But on the road to Damascus, he met the risen Lord and spent the rest of his life sharing this truth with the world. Perhaps no other person so fiercely opposed the truth of the resurrection of Jesus Christ than Saul, who became Paul the Apostle. But his personal encounter with the risen Lord made him the greatest theologian of the resurrection. Think 1 Corinthians 15, where he defends the doctrine of the resurrection. Lord Littleton, who tried to disprove his conversion, looked honestly at all the possibilities. One was that he was a fake, but he concluded the evidence didn't show that at all. The next, that he was just some kind of wild-eyed fanatic. But Paul was a highly educated, reasonable, rational person, and, and that didn't add up either. The third was he was just a complete fraud who was doing this for some, some other purpose. But, but Paul had given his life and, and suffered and, and, and died for his Savior, so that didn't make sense either. The only other option was that what he said about meeting the risen Lord was true. You know, as we stand here on this Easter Sunday morning, I don't know where your hearts are. I don't know what your relationship is with Jesus Christ. Maybe you've been a skeptic about Jesus, about God's word, about the resurrection of Christ. But I want to tell you the evidence is undeniable. Whether it comes from the shaky story of the shaking soldiers or a doubting disciple or a persuaded persecutor, Jesus really is risen from the dead. And that, my friends, is the greatest news in the world. He is risen. He is risen Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> and uh, our worship team, I believe, is going to come and close us out with some singing. <laughs> Stand. We're going to sing a few songs at the end here. We have a medley going on, so be prepared to move quickly. <laughs> we'll let Kyle play.
Happy Easter. <laughs>